Welcome to Your Business, Your Life with Matt DeFrancesco, your personal financial technician. Whether you've had years of success in your business or just starting out, Hylip Financial can help you create a vision for your business, life, and family, and align these for generational wealth. So as they say, what happens in your life affects your business. And now, on to the show. Well, hello and welcome to Your Business, Your Life with me, your host, Matt DeFrancesco. And uh, again, I'm really excited today because I got to meet Petra, and I'm going to pronounce it Petra, as uh, <laughs> since that is the proper pronunciation, but Petra Schroeder at the Collision Industry Conference back in, um, that, was, that was, uh, that was, was that April? Um, Palm Springs, January. That was okay. Yeah, that's yep. right. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, and uh, just, you know, she's had an impressive background and, you know, in an industry that women are starting to become more prominent in, I thought it would be interesting to have a woman on to kind of give that perspective on what's happening with women in the industry. So anyway, that's Petra Schroeder. She has 47 years of collision industry experience working in both Germany and the U.S. as a color product and brand manager through the many evolutions of a Exalta. And she retired in 2016, yet she remains uh, passionate and active in the collision industry. She's an active member of the Collision Industry Conference. She's a trustee with the Collision Industry Foundation and numerous other collision organizations. And I'll list all of those, have those listed on the show notes. She's won a number of awards, the 2018 Most in- Influential Woman Award, the 2018 Collision Industry. You're going to have to help me with this one <laughs> again, Pedro. The, the March Taylor you know, you know see. okay yep. award and uh, that actually well, that was for what this is doing the right things at the right time it's a collision industry award that amplifies the the presence and doing the right thing at the right time all the time first time just this following this old hawaiian idiom that's great. That's great. And, and that's what we're really all about here, too, is, uh, you know, I like working with collision shop owners that want to do the right thing the right time all the time. So she's also 2019 uh, win a cornerstone and a 2021 inductee to the Collision Industry Hall of Eagles. So she's happily married with two kids, two children, seven grandchildren and one great grandson. And I know she loves tennis. So she and I have been sharing both our passions for tennis. Uh, she has boating, golf, gardening, dancing, family, friends and traveling and she speaks four languages which is really impressive because i struggle with one <laughs> as you can see as i was doing the intro so <laughs> you're, you're doing good thanks Petra. so Petra, welcome to your business your life thank you appreciate so, you having me oh no problem i like i said I, i'm real excited about this because i just you know i know when we talked earlier just some of your insights into the industry and especially with women in the industry really intrigued me so but you know before we get started i know i highlighted a bit of your uh, history in the collision repair business could you just give me uh, maybe a little more detail how it started and it's evolved over your career sure there's a long version and a short version i think i go for the medium, uh, medium size here <laughs> so in 1969 i started my career which i didn't know where it would lead me in germany with the chemical company herberts and it was not by choice but it was more a coincidence i started with my apprenticeship and then had numerous uh, learning on the job seminars i never went to college so this is something that I really also want to point out that college education is very good with what's happening today. I would not even be have been accepted by Herberts as an apprentice if college degree would be a necessity. Mm-hmm. But looking back and fast forward, I had many opportunities to learn on the job in Germany. And then finally, the opportunity came around to join the American Standox team in America for three years. That was 1995. It only took me, I don't know, three months to decide, yes, that's what I wanted. And then leaving my home country, Germany, speaking in another language and going into another culture was something that I wanted to do. And looking back, I would not have made it any different way. It was exactly what I wanted. And in America, it's very, it's much easier than in Germany to build relationships because you are usually on a first name basis right from the start right. and uh, people are more open to talk. And I had several positions in the uh, DuPont, DuPont Performance Coatings and Exalta company. When I retired, it was very clear to me that my passion for this industry and specifically the people in it 
-hmm. was much deeper than I ever thought. And I would, it was kind of easy to separate from the company, but I never wanted to separate from the industry. Mm -hmm. That's why I decided I will stay engaged, involved to an extent that was my own choice. And I'm very happy that I did that. Yes. And the thing that amazes me most about the collision industry, and I don't have any experience in the collision industry before I really started kind of working in this niche. But the thing that really impressed me is how passionate people are about the industry. And I tell people all the time, I said, I didn't really find the industry. It kind of found me. But to me, it's like, I think we share a lot of the same values. At least I share a lot of the same values of people in the industry about doing the right thing all the time, you know, that we yep. talked about with the yep. award. Yeah. Yep. So, so, but, you know, I know, you know, so <laughs> it's actually interesting because I wouldn't even understand how, what it was like to be a woman in this industry in Germany. But, you know, in this country right now, only about 13% of the industry is female. And yet this number is growing. So still, it's a highly dominated male industry and uh, being a female can be demanding trying to break into it. So I wanted to talk to you about some advice that you might give women that are either looking to enter in, in the industry, either as a tech or as an owner. Or in any of the other positions that are oh, yeah. right now available within the collision repair industry. Mm -hmm. Remembering that a car today is really not a car. It's a computer on wheels. Right. There are so many more technical aspects to repairing a car properly and safely. And according to the uh, specifications, that it is highly recommended on my part. If you want to have a satisfying job, uh, collision repair is your position. So specifically to women... And this this old this oldie That's can right. only speak from experience. Right. So advice for women to enter the collision industry is multiple or multifold. One is we have to be patient because even though there is all this talk going on that we have to have uh, equal opportunity employers and opportunities, it still takes time for some groups, teams, bosses, teammates to get used to embrace females. If somebody wants to enter the collision repair industry, there are signs out there when you look into a shop, when you go for an interview, you look uh, whether there's are women employed, what the whole atmosphere is, the culture. There are certain signs that you can safely say, this is a place that is prepared to embrace women. But the I repeat the word, be patient. You cannot expect a change overnight. We cannot expect respect to be there right from the start. We all know that respect cannot be demanded. It has to be earned. And it may take a little bit longer for a female to be accepted and respected in this particular work environment. But I really can tell you from experience, once you go through this, it doesn't take that long and is very, very rewarding, very rewarding. The other piece that to me was always important, I never denied to be a female, to show that I'm a female. I think and I believe and I have proof from the past, if you bring together males and females into any of these positions, when you have both sides provide information and provide input and work together, that's when you get the best results in my experience. Right. Uh, the other piece is we know that men and women behave differently. They dress differently. So one, to me, important advice for females entering the collision repair industry is this. Watch what you say, watch your language. Don't try to be a man. Just remain a first-class woman. This is one of my, my standard uh, sayings that somebody in Germany, when I was, I think, 27 or 28, told me, never be a second-class man, always be a first-class woman. Like and that has guided me through these years. And I can only say it treated me very, or it, it served me very well. So dress code. If you want to be treated with respect, you have to also respect how you present yourself, how you speak, how you just do uh, present the person who you are. I'm not saying you have to just change, but watch what's happening and uh, be responsive to signs that you are getting from your environment. Again, first class woman is my mantra. 
Right. I love that mantra because I think, you know, too many times and I think in society today, and I'll probably get myself into trouble on this, but we want to talk about equality. And, and I think sometimes equality gets confused with sameness. And yet men and women are different. All right. And but we're complementary. So yes. we're not equal, but we're complementary. OK, yes. and both sides are needed. I always tell the story when I went to college, I lived on a, uh, and this is back in the uh, early eighties. I lived in a co-ed uh, on a co-ed floor, which was pretty revolutionary even at that time. And, you know, people ask, Oh, you know, what happened? And we were actually, we were probably the most behaved. We had the best relationships. We were more like a family than probably any of other halls. And I really believe that it was because of we had both males and females on the floor. We really became more like family. And yeah. we looked at the women as sisters probably more than anything else. I mean, there wasn't yeah. any hanky panky going on or anything like that. So, and I think that's a testimony to this complementary and the way we're co we complement each other. And I can and see that happening in the shop. To that effect, uh, I I was looking back in preparation for this podcast a little bit. I was not surprised to see many of my mentors were actually men. Mm -hmm. And actually, the person who suggested that I could, if I wanted to, support the American team for an, ex an ex expected assignment mm -hmm. uh, was my boss. And he's a man. And he had six young women at the time in his team and he knew exactly when he gave us something to do we were totally reliable and we were doing what we had to do to get this job done so he was a mentor another mentor was a german colleague who when in front of a big audience i always admired how he just by pure presence got the room to be quiet he, wow. Nobody had to lock, knock on the glass or nobody had to pop the microphone. He just waited there and the room got totally quiet. And I sat there as a young woman and I said, I want to be like this. I really want to learn how to do this. And how do I get to this? So the advice that you ask for women, I want to add one more thing. And that is find your personality, find your brand and stay true to what you as a person and you with your brand, which is your personality, right. can do and find out what the answers are. And again, to me, what I get back now after so many years is the same answer over and over again. It's integrity, it's honesty, and it's reliability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's key. And, and, you know, I, I love this idea of the whole personal brand and, you know, having those qualities. How, how do you think some, like a woman out there can define that for themselves? That's a loaded question because it really depends. <laughs> it really depends on sometimes I have to calm down and count onto a three because I wanted to say something maybe offensive, but you never hear me swear. You never hear me offensive in that sense. Right. I may have my German saying, uh, my German upbringing telling me just tell the truth and don't play around just tell what it is right and that is not appropriate in america necessarily so i learned how to do that but <clears throat> the first thing is really identify what you want people to see in you and what you already have as skills what you have as a personality uh, let people confirm that what they see is what they like and accept feedback accept feedback from a mentor if you choose to have one. And by the way, I always found I was mentoring many people. I was asked to. And every single time I'm mentoring, I am being mentored because right. I learn from the mentees as much as they probably pick up from me. Mm -hmm. But if you accept your personality and build a brand around this, so when somebody talks to you and somebody deals with you, they get the same expectations and these expectations are met by the person mm -hmm. and there's no disappointment if you go to a store and you're used to a certain performance of a brand if you get a disappointment and this brand doesn't perform anymore what do you do you look for other brands you look for right. other people and so define what your personality is and hopefully it fits your environment i'm not suggesting change your personality but watch for reactions and watch for possibilities to slightly and subtly change. If you get consistently the same answer 
this, I really don't like this. Uh, the person that, that deals with me doesn't like this. Is it me or is it him or her? Right. That's great advice because I think too many times we get stuck in our own mentalities. And sometimes if we get a negative response, we start to think, you know, something's wrong with these people. And I think if you're constantly getting the same response all the time, <laughs> yeah, you went to Zig Ziglar say, yeah, every time you point a finger, there's three coming back at you, yeah. you know, and I think that's a great idea that people should, anybody, whether it's man or woman should keep in mind that we've always got to be evaluating and thinking about, you know, not only what we're saying, but the responses that we're getting and, and what we can learn from everybody. Yeah. And so. the learning process to me was the fun part. Sometimes you kind of play with some new stuff that you learn and you implement it. And when it works, you implement it more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And so the the traits that I have now, I think, I'm not sure whether they can be changed. I don't want them to change uh, right. because like they have guided me quite well through my 47 years of business or and, and now ongoing. Right. Uh, up right. to going up to more than 50. Right. Well, you wouldn't have the awards that you've had too. That <laughs> that wasn't the case. So I, I wouldn't change anything, Pedro. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to ask you, and it was something that kind of just as you were talking about these things. So we've been talking about women's attitudes, but maybe some advice for the men, because again, a lot of these guys probably, you know, if they went to the trade school, probably was predominantly male, working environments, probably male. And all of a sudden a woman comes into the shop, either as a, you know, as a tech, as a painter, or maybe even as a, some type of manager, production manager or something like that. What would you suggest to them, especially if it feels like it's something, it's like out of their comfort zone to be able to be in a working environment with a woman? Yes. And again, this is another kind of loaded question. I would hope that if a shop owner decides to bring in females into the organization, that he or she would already have prepared the team that a female comes on board. Mm -hmm. and kind of get the first information and the feeling of reception from the teammates, how do they feel about this? Okay. So as a, I think it starts with a shop owner, mm -hmm. shop manager, to prepare the team that this is now a change, if it is a change. Right. But technicians, male technicians, I think should be as patient as I just said, so recommended for the women. Mm -hmm. But the technicians may have a tougher point on this one because now all of a sudden there is a competition that is supposed to be i don't want to say the weaker one but uh, they may think well can this woman really do the job can they do the heavy lifting can they do this do they have the knowledge uh, stuff like this mm -hmm. i would hope that it starts with the shop owner shop manager to prepare a team environment where both genders are equally accepted mm -hmm. and where you also have an agreed upon culture that is carried out all the way into the shop. So I see you have a wonderful background in, yeah. in a shop. If I was a female and I would apply for a job, I would ask, can I please go into the shop and just look around and what it looks like? There's many signs that you can see by working, by, by walking through a shop. And I bring up this old, old example that sometimes still exists today. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, I see this less and less and less. And these are the famous calendars that mm -hmm. are in the shops in the base. Right. Fortunately, we see this less and less and less. And again, there are signs. And it, it takes patience on both sides. And technicians should realize, like we said before, if you have work together between females and males, that's when you get your best results. And both personalities, both genders have their own strength and some not so good strength. Put them together and you are unbeatable. Yeah. No, no, that's exactly right. Yeah, it was funny when you mentioned about the calendars. I kept thinking of the snap-on <laughs> calendars. I'm going, yeah, and you're right. You don't see those very often anymore. I mean, I remember back years ago, I was selling welding alloys and I would call on different shops and, and yeah, you would see them all the time. In you know whether it's a you know, auto shop or mechanical shop or machine shop or something like that, and you're seeing less and less in that. So I'm glad to see that. One thing that I would be dismissed if I didn't mention this, uh, and it goes back to us as females, there is a way, there's a time to dress up nicely, mm -hmm. and there's a time where you really have to dress up to do the job. Mm -hmm. 
And it's a very fine line to go, fine line to walk. And that's where a good management at the shop also sets the tone for these kind of encounters and for these kind of situations and explains, okay, here are our rules. And each one has to kind of commit to these rules. But again, sexy dresses do not belong in a body shop environment. Right. There's a place for those, but not necessarily and definitely not in my book for body shop environment. Right. No, I I, I can certainly understand that. It would seem kind of <laughs> it would seem kind of out of place too if they're well, in the shop with a dress. So <laughs> No, not dresses, but dress in a kind of a, yeah. a sexy sexy way. Right. That's right. that's not the place to do that. No, and no, that's, I that goes it. along with the respect and the expectations that you set for yourself, right? How you want to be treated. Yeah. And, you know, it's one thing that's been a big topic lately. And especially, I'm one of the hosts of the uh, Collision Cocktail Hour. And mm-hmm. that's one thing that a number of people are interested in talking about is this idea of culture. And one of my uh, clients has really done a great job with building culture. And his average tenure in his shop is about 15 years, which really amazed me when he told me that. And I think a lot of it is because of the culture that he's developed. But one thing, one thing that he implemented was there's a dress code and they have polo shirts that they wear, you know, you need to wear, you know, slacks or jeans. But again, it's that consistency that I think, you know, I went to Catholic school and I think there's a benefit to uniform sometimes. Yes, yes. Again, you kind of homogenize everybody and it's not like who's got the most expensive outfit, you know, who's, you know, uh, you know, who's dressing in a uh, provocative way, who's dressing, you know, very conservatively and judgments being made. Everybody's the same. And I think there's a, a, there's a benefit of that part of developing yeah. that kind of culture within a shop. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're getting a little close on time here, Petra. So one thing we've, we've, and we've talked a lot about, you know, women techs, managers, production people, you know, those type of things. But I want to talk a little bit about the woman owner. And again, we're Mm -hmm. starting to see more and more of that. And we're starting to see also some businesses kind of transition to where, especially if it's a husband and wife, where the wife is taking ownership for the benefits that a woman-owned business can have. And are there any unique challenges that you think a woman owner may have over a male owner? In my mind, a smaller difference is the empathy that women usually have towards uh, personal situations and that there is a different way of treating certain situations. For example, I give you an example from my life. Having been brought up in Germany, I do not walk through a group and say, how are you? How are you? How are you? When I ask you, how are you? I know that there was something that was bad in your life and I really want to know, are you okay? And that is the empathy that I think females can express easier and and better uh, than sometimes men do. I'm not Mm -hmm. generalizing here. I'm just saying most of the time women can express this better. And it's not an expression of weakness when you ask these personal questions. It builds the trust. It builds your brand. It builds your interest in the people and the honest interest. And people can feel whether you mean this or you just say it, how are you, and you already walk your way. So that's one advantage. Anything else I see is... Probably pretty much even. Even, right. Yeah. It's, you know, and I, and I think that whole idea of that people don't care what you know until they know that you care is really important. And I agree with you. I mean, I read a lot of them. Uh, I don't know if you ever read any Brene Brown's uh, works, uh, any of her mm-hmm. books, but in Brene Brown is really all about that idea of empathy and vulnerable leadership, being able yeah. to go up, yeah. you know, talk to an employee, you know, kind of get into the muck with them and sometimes just being able to say, instead of trying to solve the problem, because that's what we men try to do all the time. We could say, Oh, you got this problem. We're going to solve it. But sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when you're, when you're in the garbage of life, you need somebody to just put their arm around. You said, you know what? That really yes. sucks. Right. <laughs> and you can display this also at home. I mean, it's the same situation. Right. If, if I have a question to my husband, sometimes I don't want to know the solution. I just want him to hug me. I just right. want him to give me comfort and men tend to be having the solution available and sometimes it's not what we want or what's desired yeah i'm not saying it's wrong it's <laughs> it's good in, in many ways but it's yeah empathy is something that female probably with the mother instinct do in a different way right and in this case i dare to say in a better way 
Someone. I, I don't think you need to dare say that at all. I think most <laughs> men, you know, especially if we've been married for some time, we've learned it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's taken me a long time, but now I know when my wife starts like spouting about, and she's got this problem, my job is just to shut up and just listen. That's all I'm supposed to do. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I could certainly appreciate that. And I think that goes a long way, even with your employees. I think even, yes. even yes. if it's a male dealing with a male employee, that whole idea of empathy and sometimes just listening instead of trying to correct it. Yeah. Yeah. Because we know when we make mistakes, my God, it's like, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. we do, right? So, well, Petra, do you have any final thoughts you want to leave the audience? Yes. Thanks for asking. Oh, um, no I have this big passion of mine that uh, I really want the recognition given to the collision repair industry that it's not a dirty industry anymore. No. It is a very clean environment. If you look at the shops that are at the top, you can eat off the floor. Yeah. Their organization, their structure, their culture, everything is taken into consideration with the ultimate goal in mind to repair the car safely and following the necessary procedures to do so. Right. And that requires a training piece. So raising the awareness that collision repair industry is not only a second choice for people that go to high school. It should be a first choice mm -hmm. because it provides a good living. It is great with opportunities in this job. Mm -hmm. So many variety of jobs. I think I can name 50, 55 from the top of my head. So many jobs are in a collision repair business. Right. You can have paint companies. You can have vendor companies. You can have insurance companies. There are so many jobs. Once you have the basic knowledge, it's a great industry to be in provides a great living. And I really, really would love for this industry to be recognized how many changes, positive changes were made over the last decade and two decades that go unrecognized for the most part. I wish everybody would say, hey, I need to talk to my son's daughter, whether they want to go into the collision repair industry. It's a great industry to work in and live in. Right, right. You know, and it's interesting because I, you know, a lot of the work I do is helping, you know, align the family and business for generational wealth. And, you know, a lot of times the business is the big asset. So we've got to figure out how does the business fit into all this. And I can't tell you how many times I've talked to owners and they're looking at a transition and we'll be talking about the kids and they'll be like, ah, the kids aren't interested. They saw me grind yeah. through this and I don't want them to go through this. But then you yeah. also talk to the kids and they're like, well, no, we'd be interested. We just wouldn't need to learn. Mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden, if I can get the parents and the kids to become congruent, we can start to create a family legacy down the road. Yeah, and yeah. I agree with you. I mean, it's amazing to me, just even the technology that's involved in collision repair. It is now, you know, if you're a shop owner out there and you're trying to pay your tax a hamburger wage, you know, a hamburger flipper wage, I think you're making a big mistake because it is much more technical than that. Yes, yes. And there's a lot of knowledge that goes into all of that. So I agree with you. I, I think it's a fast to me, it's such a fascinating industry and it is a professional industry. Yes, yes. Very professional and with all the technical pieces that are now available and coming with more and more cars. It's getting more diversified and it's getting more technical. And uh, I mean, the, the job position that we didn't have before is all these ADES requirements. It's a different position. You can be an ADES person and do the pre-testing and scanning and stuff like this and do the test drives to make sure the car performs in the way that it has to perform. Right. So there is a lot of new positions that didn't exist five years ago. Exactly. Calibration, all that stuff. You're yeah, exactly yeah. right. So, uh, Peter, if people want to get in contact with you, just uh, we're going to put a lot of this in the show notes and also what you might be able to help one of the listeners with. I mean, now that you're a collisionista, I guess, <laughs> is what you I love that term. I just I, I love that term. Yeah, it's, it's it came up out of the blue. Uh, <laughs> no collision collisionista was kind of natural almost. And I right. mentioned it two or three times and. It's stuck and it's I'm stuck with it now. And there you I'm go. Happy about, I'm happy about it. <laughs> right, right. So so anyway, we'll put all your contact information into the show sure. notes. Okay. So Peter, sure. I want to thank you so much. I think this was really informative. I just I just it's just a joy to talk with you. And I <laughs> it was funny. I remember kind of walking into that room where we were in Richmond, you know, and yeah. just I kind of saw you and you just there's something that radiates about you. So <laughs> I think what you talked about about developing this presence and this personal brand, you have taken to heart. And I think you hold a lot of respect within the community. So I want to thank you for being a guest on my show. 
Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And the last thanks goes to you, the audience. Uh, Thank you for listening to Your Business, Your Life with me, Matt DeFrancesco. If you've not subscribed to the podcast, please click the subscribe button below. That way, when a new episode comes out, it'll download directly to your device. If you're watching us on YouTube, please give us a five-star review if you like what you're seeing. That way, we start to move up the list and get this great content and great guests like Petra to many more people. So again, I want to thank Petra for being on. And we'll talk to you next time on Your Business, Your Life. So uh, take care and God bless. Hey, I really want to thank you for listening to the Your Business, Your Life podcast. If you want to be notified when new episodes become available, click the subscribe button below. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of High Lift Financial. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investment, legal, or tax advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified professional with any questions you may have regarding your business or personal planning. DeFrancesco Financial Concierge, LLC, DBA, High Lift Financial, is a registered investment advisor. Registration with the United States Securities and Exchange Commission or any state security authority does not imply a certain level of skill or training.